General Motors grinds the gears, as it's worth, to avoid bankruptcy. The reinsurance business consolidates as Swiss Re makes a major acquisition. On the markets, we saw the down the Nasdaq move higher. The S&P 500 hitting a four and a half year high, and oil prices are down. Hello everyone, you're watching the World Business Report. I'm Rico Hezon in London. And in New York, I'm Manisha Tank. A very warm welcome from here. Now, it's been a big week for the car giant GM. There's been fighting talk from the firm this Friday after speculation of bankruptcy rocked the shares. In the last three months, GM stock's been on a roller coaster ride. In fact, on the last month, just that alone, the shares are down 30% to hit an 18-year low on Wednesday. Once a bastion of American car making, GM struggled to satisfy its customers, losing $3.8 billion in the first three quarters of 2005. Sales are down more than 20% in September and October. Stuck in reverse gear, GM stock plunged to a new 23-year low earlier this week as investors bet on rumors the firm could file for bankruptcy protection. So GM boss Rick Wagner stepped into the driving seat, appealing for calm in a letter to workers on the firm's internal website. He's ruled out bankruptcy and is confident the world's biggest car maker, for now anyway, can steer the course. The letter, which quickly was picked up by the press, helped bounce the stock back up by Friday. But now, a press report in a Detroit newspaper, which is based in the heartlands of American car making, suggests GM's about to announce a restructuring that could pave the way for at least 25,000 new job cuts. Managers repeated on Friday that failure was not an option but unions are likely to put up an intense fight to jobs or benefit cuts. Wall Street's needs are much more straightforward, evidence of a handbrake turn and onto the road to recovery as soon as the lights turn green. So at Bank of America, Ronald Tadros is a securities analyst. He knows all about this subject. Uh, Ronald, uh, it's been a pretty rocky week. Where can we expect GM to go from here, given the letter, given the assertions by managers? Uh, well, well, GM, um, obviously, our target for over the next 12-month period is a $16 target. So over the next 12 months, we expect the stock to, to move down. Uh, we think uh, GM's margin gap versus their competition and the fact that our, our belief that it's prohibitively expensive to restructure the company are going to continue to weigh on the stock. It could trade up a little bit in the short run. It's come down pretty quick, as you pointed out. Now, lots of rumors over bankruptcy. Is that going to happen? Do we know? Are there any clues? Um, well, we, uh, we, we, we've assigned a risk, uh, pro a chance of about 40% over the next two years of bankruptcy. Um, and to, our, to my earlier point, I, I think uh, that'll be a function of the fact that when the company comes to grips with the idea that it's prohibitively expensive to restructure the business, uh, equally important, we think uh, the current management team, as you pointed out, uh, is set on trying to avoid bankruptcy. And so there may need to be some management changes before that happens. Uh, Ronald, this is uh, Rico Hezon in London. If you were in the position of Chief Executive Richard Wagoner, what would you do to turn around the fortunes of General Motors and gain back the confidence of investors? Um, well, well, GM uh, needs to reduce capacity uh, by, by a lot. Uh, they need to reduce the number of brands, maybe as much in, as in half. Uh, GM needs to uh, break uh, some of their labor contracts that allow that allow the union lifetime employment. They need to reduce health care. Uh, so there are some severe uh, actions that need to be taken. Uh, the problem is is that uh, there's no precedent for this stuff to happen um, without spending a lot of money, which we don't think GM has. Okay, briefly, Ronald. Uh, one thing that um, really alarms me is when you look at the market cap. Apparently, this week it fell below Ford's. Now, what does that say about the dynamic in the market for these stocks? Um, well, I, I think uh, it's hard to compare GM versus Ford because they have different balance sheets. Um, but, but there's no doubt the market caps of these companies are, are a fraction of their sales. I mean, um, uh, less than 10% of their sales right now. Um, and uh, discounting, I, I, I think, uh, given the fact GM doesn't have any earnings, uh, some kind of option value uh, on potential future earnings. Okay, we'll leave it there, Ronald Tadros. Thank you for joining us from yep, Bank of America. You. Providing insurance for insurance companies, otherwise known as reinsurance, is big business. On Friday, the world's second largest insurance company, Swiss Re, unveiled plans to take control of the bulk of General Electric's insurance unit in a deal worth almost 7 billion U.S. dollars. Soman Bhatia has more. 
reinsurance, the highly complex, highly risky and potentially lucrative art of selling backup insurance to the insurance companies themselves to help them meet exceptional circumstances. In recent times, though, there have been a stream of tragic and damaging natural disasters from Asia to America. General Electric's insurance solutions, for instance, has been reeling from the devastation caused by hurricanes in the United States, losing nearly $380 million in the third quarter this year and $700 million over the last five years. Swiss Re's London address is in this distinctive building and analysts say the firm is also taking a bold risk by buying insurance solutions. Integrating the businesses may not be easy, they say. The firm will also have to raise $7.5 billion to finance the deal. However, Swiss Re says the merger will add to its earnings per share by 2007. The size and the power of diversification in our business have never been more important. For that reason, we believe that the future favours strong players who can provide clients with ca the capacity and the security which they need. The addition of the GE unit will increase Swiss Re's annual revenues to around $35 billion. And that means it will close the gap on its large arrival, Munich Re, to around $10 billion. Simon Bartier, BBC News. Quite a number of deals in Europe going on this week. Now, President Bush begins a three-day visit to China. It starts on Saturday with trade and the yuan currency top of the agenda. Meetings with Chinese President Hu Jintao could set the tone for relations between the two powers for years to come. The U.S. is on a four-nation tour of Asia, trying to solidify its influence in the region in the face of China's rising economic and military might. President Bush aims to convince the Chinese to allow the yuan to float freely against other currencies, although China did increase the value of the yuan by 2.1% in July, Washington says it remains undervalued. Now that gives Chinese exports an unfair advantage and has led to a rather worrying trade imbalance between the two countries. So does everybody agree on what we've decided are the key points for these talks? Let's talk to Dr. Richard Bush. Uh, he is head of Brookings Center for Northeast Asian Policy Studies. He's in Washington. Uh, Richard, first of all, um, of the key things we'll be, talk they'll be talking about in uh, China, of course the currency is a big issue, but uh, what are the other ones? Uh, two other things. First of all, the overall imbalance, and then second, the protection of intellectual property or the lack of protection. These are all big ones. Uh, they're tied, in fact, to your first story. Uh, sooner or later, China is going to be exporting cars to the United States, an undervalued yu uh, yuan, and uh, lack of protection of intellectual property would give China an advantage against Detroit. And indeed, just today, GM reaching an amicable agreement over a dispute on intellectual property. But when it comes to President Bush and trips like this, that things are decided pretty far in advance. Can we expect any open agreement, anything being signed off when it comes to anything like the currency or intellectual property, the major economic pillars of these talks? Um, I don't think so. Uh, on currency, uh, China does not want to be perceived as giving in to U.S. pressure. So I anticipate that if they decide to allow uh, the yuan to gain in value, uh, it will occur two or three months from now, perhaps after Chinese New Year, uh, and uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens. With respect to uh, intellectual property, uh, the problem is not in terms of the desire of the central government to do something. It's really in terms of their capacity uh, to force uh, lower level uh, units in the system uh, to make changes, and uh, they just don't have the capacity. Mr. Bush, this is uh, Rico. He is on in London. The United States keeps on complaining about this huge trade imbalance between the Americans and the Chinese. But shouldn't the Americans also take note that a lot of these American companies that have set up business in China are exporting products made in China back to the United States? And the, these American companies should be, be blamed for the imbalance. Uh, well, you make a good point. Uh, I would uh, go even further and say the, the source of the imbalance here is uh, a structural one and it's macroeconomic. Uh, it flows from the fact that the United States uh, spends far more than it saves and from the fact that China saves far more than it spends. And until you can uh, get some uh, a rectification uh, of this dual imbalance, uh, we will continue to have a huge uh, Chinese surplus and huge uh, American deficit. 
Thank you very much for joining us from the Brookings Centre in Washington. On to the markets, and I can tell you that the Dow and the Nasdaq moved higher. One of the big movers was HP. That was after strong earnings. So the Dow up 46 points. We have the Nasdaq up about 0.3% by the close. European shares closing higher thanks to mining stocks, but gains were reduced after European Central Bank President Jean-Claude Trichet hinted interest rates would rise in December. And before we go to the break, if you would like to send us your comments or views, send us an email, thebiz at bbc.co.uk. Indeed, thanks for, those, uh, thanks for those emails about uh, long-haul or short-haul flights we had earlier in the week. Stay with us on the BBC. BBC One presents Shirley Henderson. You have no idea how tempting you are to a man like me. You are? And Rufus Sewell. I'm going to marry you. In The Taming of the Shrew. Give me Kate! The weirdo. Shakespeare retold. Monday at 8.30 on BBC One. Hello everyone. You're watching the World Business Report on BBC World. I'm Regal He's on in London. And I'm Anisha Tank. I'm in New York. A very warm welcome from here also. Now, the United States and the European Union have reached a breakthrough deal on air travel between the continents. The so-called Open Skies deal would allow every EU and American-based airline to fly between every city in Europe and the US, scrapping fiercely protected competition barriers. Talks have been ongoing for at least a decade, but the US State Department has secured a tentative deal now. The agreement must be reviewed by EU transport ministers who will meet next month. So let's get some more on it all. BBC correspondent Laura Trevelyan's here. Uh, Laura, it's been going on for a decade. What happened? Where was the breakthrough? Well, it has. And these, this is only a tentative deal. And actually, almost exactly this time last year, there was another tentative deal. So what this is about, effectively, is allowing every EU airline and every American airline to fly between every city in Europe and in America. And what uh, the two sticking points hitherto have been the fact that at Heathrow, a very popular destination, the slots there have been very protected, and American Airlines haven't been able to have as many slots as, say, BA and Virgin. And the other big sticking point has been the fact that the American law says that foreign investors can only earn up to a certain percentage of American Airlines. Now, it's just not clear at this stage exactly what the nature of the deal is that has been reached, but some agreement has been reached some degree on those two sticking points. Very interesting timing. Um, this just this week, and the viewers will know this, we were covering the fact that uh, there are uh, at least four carriers who were grappling with bankruptcy this, this year here in the US. Um, given the fact that they have these huge debts, how could this change things? Well, what's interesting is that while the U.S. domestic carriers are doing pretty badly, actually their international routes are quite profitable, American Airlines, for example. So it's very attractive to them, this idea that the transatlantic routes are going to be opened up to them and that some of the European routes are going to be opened up too. So that could potentially transform their business situation and offset the fact that they're losing money domestically. And now equally, British Airways and Virgin would be very keen on being able to buy into American Airlines. So you can see where the trade-off might be but the actual details we haven't got yet. Okay, well, it's certainly all very exciting. I think if you're in the aviation industry, we'll leave it there. Laura, thank you so much. Laura Trevelyan, our correspondent, taking a look at all of that. Now, plans to tax big oil companies following record profits over the last three months are likely to be vetoed by President Bush. The Senate has approved a bill that would end, extend, in fact, tax cuts for individuals, but impose a $4.3 billion tax on some oil producers President Bush has already threatened to veto the move, which is being described as a windfall tax in disguise. Jane O'Brien has more. The five big oil companies made a combined profit of almost $30 billion in the last quarter, infuriating many Americans who are paying record prices at the pumps in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. The Senate Energy Committee acknowledged the national mood this month when it summoned the oil barons to a meeting that was intended to show who was boss. And on Friday, they agreed a $4.3 billion tax on the biggest producers, a tax that was instantly condemned and will almost certainly be vetoed by President Bush. It really does not, uh, does not improve our energy supply situation, does not lower the price of oil, does not lower the price of gasoline. So basically, it, it, it's a tax that intends to penalize companies for something that I don't know what they are guilty of since profit. The profit motive is this is what capitalism is all about. And now we are saying, no, 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 you're making too much money. 
But no matter the reason for dropping the tax, to most people this looks more like a game of big buck power politics with President Bush on the side of oil. Gasoline prices have dropped slightly in the past few weeks, but they're still the focus for a lot of American resentment. And with George Bush experiencing the lowest approval rating of his presidency, vetoing a tax on oil companies could further damage his public image. Jane O'Brien, BBC News, New York. Now here in London, winter is starting to bite as it, it is across much of the northern hemisphere and it threatens to blow a chill wind through some of the world's leading economies. The price of natural gas has nearly doubled over the past six months and analysts are predicting further sharp climbs if cold weather pushes up demand. Businesses and domestic users could see their bills rise sharply. Electricity costs could also go up. I'm joined now by energy analyst Peter Carlin to discuss this issue. How serious is the situation? Well, the situation is serious, actually. You've got both a very short-term spike in the price of natural gas across Europe and in the UK because of a sudden drop in temperature. When the uh, temperatures start to drop below 3 degrees Celsius, as they move down, there's an exponential knock-on effect with demand, and so prices take off. But in the medium and long term, you've got a secondary problem, too, which is the fact that in places like New York and the Henry Hub delivery area for the Northeast, You've seen prices move up over 300% over the past four years. You've got a fundamental supply-demand imbalance that's coupled with a constricted delivery system that needs to be developed. Now, in the UK and in Europe, a lot of new delivery systems are coming online within the next two years, but this is going to be a very precarious winter for prices, both for the industrial users who have interruptible, which could be shut off if uh, things get tight, and for the prices that home uh, heaters are going to have to pay. Peter, it's Manish from New York here. I mean, you mentioned North America there, and it's obviously a very acute problem over here. Even Alan Greenspan was talking about it earlier this year and his concerns for gas prices and the impact on inflation. But something that I've been hearing um, the CEOs of oil companies say over here in energy companies is they find it alarming that U.S. energy policy prevents them from bringing these supplies from the U.S. to U.S. consumers. How does all of that change the price situation? Well, the price situation is still, in the U.S. at least, within the domestic market and the ability to deliver more gas more efficiently through the U.S. gas network. The fact is, is that not only is there a fundamental imbalance, you have a delivery system that's not really up to the task of where the demand is starting to come from. Um, in places like Europe, it's a little bit easier in the next couple of years, but for this winter, actually, things are quite difficult. And what you're seeing is a fundamentally tight market compounded by low temperatures at a strange time of year, mid-November in the European case, and um, a situation where you're talking about a commodity that's not easily stored. A major uh, gas pipeline was inaugurated yesterday between Russia and Turkey. How important is this for Western Europe? Right. Well, this is indicative of the way the market is going to go in the next few years. This Blue Star project is delivering a significant amount of Russian gas into the Turkish market, which they hope that they can then extend to Sehan, a major oil terminus too, which will deliver gas into the southern European zone. It's significant within the fact that in the gas industry you have bottleneck places. So to the places that you get new deliveries, yes, but the major population zones are still going to wait in Europe for two to three years, if not more, and in the U.S., you need a larger overhaul of the system to have more efficient distribution network. Peter Carlin, energy analyst, thank you so much for joining thank you. us. It isn't just cold in London, Rico, let me tell you. Now, there's been much focus this week on the deeply troubled economy of the Gaza Strip. Israel withdrew from the territory a few months ago, but it had maintained an extremely tight grip on its access routes to the outside world. Under American pressure, the Israelis have now agreed to step back a little and allow a freer flow of trade. Everywhere, signs of poverty. Gaza's population is exploding. Unemployment is close to 40%. More and more families struggle to get by. Gaza is in dire economic trouble, but the occupying Israeli army withdrew during the summer. This rubble is all that remains of the abandoned Jewish settlements. The Palestinians 
are in control here. And the hope is that there's the possibility now of some economic regeneration. And this is encouraging. The Palestinians have already put hundreds of abandoned Israeli greenhouses back into action. But so far, this is the only real sign of new economic life in Gaza. Part of the explanation lies here. Most of Gaza's trade passes through this point on Israel's border, but the flow was severely limited by Israeli security measures. Israel said it had to guard against Palestinian suicide bombers. The Palestinians claimed their economy was being deliberately strangled, and Israel has just agreed to ease its grip and allow a freer flow of goods. It should now be easier for Gaza's factories to export, easier to create jobs. But will the new border deal last? It's easy to imagine political tensions and violence tightening up the frontier again. People here expect the issue of connecting with the outside world to be an enduring problem. If you want to spell it out, it's access. It's A-C-C-E-S-S. Access is totally controlled uh, by, uh, by Israel. Um, this, is, this is the major problem um, that, that we're currently facing. Even if Israel permanently eases the trade flow, Gaza will still be a hopelessly crowded, unruly rump of territory, badly cut off from Palestinian markets in the occupied West Bank. Gaza will always be a tough place to do business. Alan Johnston, BBC News, Gaza. Certainly a tough place to do business, but certainly very encouraging to see the moves that are being made there and to aid communities uh, in terms of economic development. Rico, what an interesting week it's been. It's really roller coaster market week, I think, from this side anyway. I know, also in Europe, it's been a roller coaster ride. Two days of gains, two days of losses, but finishing off in positive territory. Well, have a great weekend, Manisha. I'm Rico Hezon here in London. See you again on Monday. And I'm Manisha Tanga. I'm in New York. To all of you, have a good weekend. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.